Bible, in Acts chapter 4, in Acts chapter 12, verse 4, most other translations use the word Passover. And when we talk about the, you know, the, the death of Jesus Christ and the things leading up to his crucifixion, and obviously um, the, Jesus Christ that rose from the dead, you know, there's many angles, there's many different messages, there's a lot that we can talk about, there's a lot that we can share over a weekend like this. And uh, it's a special message. It's a message worth proclaiming. It's a message that we can share. And I, as I just stood here this morning, I just have the sense of being thankful, you know, for what the Lord has done for us. Because it's not about something we did. It's something He did as He created the church, as He created the new covenant by He inaugurated the new covenant and drew us, brought us close to Himself through His death and resurrection. And it's also a message of hope. It's a message of hope that we have this morning. So, as I was preparing, I thought that, you know, in general, um, you know, today and Monday is public holidays. And for many people, it might be a, a, a weekend, an off weekend. We know the schools have a midterm break. And, and many of you, I believe, don't, maybe don't have to work today because of the fact that it's a public holiday but that's not what it's about. It's about something much more special and so much more deeper. So when we look at our Namibian calendars, it will say Good Friday, and it will talk about Easter Sunday and Easter Monday. And as I said, for many Namibians, many we will probably see a lot of cars over the weekend from other places in Namibia. Swakop is a, is a, a, a sought-after place this time of the year. But I believe in every church from Noordover to Rundu and Ketmans Whip and Gubabas and Swakop, church is also a special place where we gather on a day like this and where we celebrate and where we speak and where we share and where we use the Lord's Supper all together and where we remember why and what Jesus Christ has done for us. So when we read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, Paul's writing and the other epistles, we see the value, we see the message of the cross and the meaning for us as God's people. So it's not about the public holiday. It's all about gathering together as God's people and celebrating a special time like this. So this morning I want to read to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. And uh, as I said, I think there's, there's an abundance of different messages and sermons, I believe, for any preacher or pastor or church leader, whether it's a big church, small church, a house church, whether you meet under a tree or in a big building or even a living room, there's an abundance of messages and angles from where we can preach this message leading up where, where Jesus was preparing his disciples, where he said the, there's many things that he will have to suffer up to the crucifixion and what happened in between and up to um, uh, Monday and the message of Jesus that rose again. But I want to focus this morning on 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. And we're going to end off this morning where we will use communion or the Lord's Supper all together. And Paul writes clearly, he gives us uh, a special angle or one of the angles that we can use for a weekend like this. And I want to read to you from the English Standard Version. It will be up there on the screen as well. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord, that the Lord on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Okay, so Jesus hasn't come back for his church, for the bride yet. So we need to proclaim this message. We need to speak about this message. We need to speak, well, preach and speak about um, the cross of Christ. And uh, you will see I've underlined it there. Twice Jesus refers, or Paul refers to, he said, do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. And then in verse 25, Paul writes again and he says, do this in remembrance of me. So I believe that's a key passage that Paul uses this morning, or not this morning, that we can focus on this morning. Do this as you remember what Christ did for us. So the Lord's, as we use the Lord's Supper just now in a few minutes, it's a time where we celebrate how Jesus Christ established the new covenant for his people. It's a celebration of Christ's work. And so each time that we drink the cup of the Lord's Supper, we are to remember that the shedding of the blood of Jesus is how the new covenant was established. So it's important that we remember him and that we understand what happened over this special time. Now this is something where we know that there's a lot of things probably happening where our faith can be eroded, but it's also an opportunity for us as the church where our faith can be built. And every time when something was prophesied in the Old Testament and it came to pass, especially in the New Testament, it builds our faith. It strengthens our belief that it's not just something random that happened, but it, that, that it's something by God's design. God's plans and God's purposes will always come to pass. And we will, can read from Jeremiah 31, and I just briefly want to read it to you, where the, the new covenant was prophesied. We are God's new covenant people, and it was prophesied way back in Jeremiah 31. And it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And I will forgive their iniquities, and I will remember their sin no more. So the new covenant is God's pledge to forgive the sins of his people and to put his law within us and to write them on our hearts and to be our God and to make us his people. Also, we find it in Ezekiel 36 verse 27 where um, it, it, it also prophesies the new covenant. Um, I will read you briefly. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and, and be careful to observe my ordinances. So the Lord's Supper celebrates the new covenant and its establishment in the death of Jesus Christ. It was prophesied in various places in the Old Testament. And today we can celebrate and we can testify as the church of Jesus Christ with believers, with the global or the universal church today about this good news that we have, the good news that we can share. So I, I will start this morning in a sense how do we remember Christ in the Lord's Supper? Because that is what Paul writes and he says, twice Jesus referred to that, that we should remember Jesus Christ. How do we remember Christ in the Lord's Supper? How do we zoom in and how do we focus on Jesus Christ specifically? And I will answer that by saying, by thinking about what and why Jesus did what he did. How do we remember Christ in the Lord's Supper? Something that we are encouraged as God's people to do often. How do we remember Christ? By thinking about what He did and why He did it. So I believe as we have a church service this morning, as we gather together this morning, important questions I believe we all want to understand. And today we're not preaching something new. It's more a place where we can celebrate and we can answer those questions about the what and the why um, in terms of what Jesus did over this. And I mean, we, we can all go home and probably you've read it already this morning in the Gospels of Mark and Matthew and Luke and John about the crucifixion. You can go and read it and, and study it. And it's something that all of us that's part of the church will probably know of by heart. So I believe that you will agree with me this morning that we remember significant things. Things that's less significant, we tend to forget. 
things that's really important, things that's really of big value or great value, we remember. I mean, it's not something very spiritual, but it's a fact of life that the big things that happen to us. I remember my baptism probably 22 years ago very well. I believe many of you will remember your baptisms very well. We will, uh, those of us that's been married, we will remember the day that, uh, the day that special day that we were married. You will remember well, probably I remember the birth of my uh, three children. I remember it. I was present. It was special. It was moments where you were not in control, but it was special moments where we will remember um, our kids that were born, my wedding day. I remember things like my mom's homemade pizza. I went to scouts on a Friday night and it was a bit of a family culture that when I came home, it was my mom uh, uh, made a homemade pizza. And it was something that I will just, the taste of that something is just something that I will re remember for the rest of my life. Um, I remember my father's 70th birthday. It was a special event where the whole Holtz family gathered together and we had the, uh, the privilege to celebrate my dad's birthday all together. And I believe you can go on a memory lane from your childhood. There were many things that you will uh, remember. I, I'm not going to give you all the examples. One actually came to pass. Um, I remember my first meal as a student in Stellenbosch. You know, I was very impressed, all the men and in the men's race, we sat together at the table and the, um, the prim of the course, he prayed for us. And guess what the first meal was? It was a wonderful pizza. And all the 18 or 19 year olds, we thought, well, that's awesome. It's a really a, a great way to receive us. And he prayed for us and we started to eat in about 15 seconds later. He said, you are finished. Go and stand outside in the sun. And from there, the rest of the month, we're hell. You know? But that's the type of things we always remember, things that happen to us. I can give you probably examples of, of less nice things that uh, we probably remember or we are aware of that we would rather, would like to forget. Now, I'm not going to give you um, examples of that. It's on the negative side. But I trust that the significant, beautiful, special things in life we remember. And in the same way, Paul writes and he quotes Jesus and he says twice in that passage, do this in remembrance of me. And I'm asking the question this morning, as we gather here, why are we here? And how do we remember Christ in the Lord's Supper? Well, we remember by what Jesus did and why he did it. That's the essence. That's the crux, I believe. So there's a lot of references, as I said, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the crucifixion. One that I want to, um, it's almost like a summary verse in Matthew tw uh, chapter 16, verse um, 21, that I will read to you, um, almost summarizing where Jesus spoke to his disciples as he prepared them for what were to happen. And it, it's, it's as follows. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. It's almost like a very brief summary of everything that we celebrate over Passover or Easter weekend from the, from the Friday to the Monday. And if we were to break it down a little bit, Jesus said, that he must go to Jerusalem because it was prophesied. He had to go nowhere else but to Jerusalem. And then he said he had to suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. It's something that had to happen. And then he said, and he had to be killed. And the fourth point, and on the first uh, uh, and on the, on the third day, he had to. To be raised. Now that's in short what Jesus said, um, shared with his disciples, and I think it must have been probably challenging. It must have been probably confusing to them. They, they obviously we we see in in scripture that I completely Peter and the guys didn't add handles on exactly what Jesus meant. Jesus did so many signs. He did so many wonders. He fed people. He healed people. He touched lives. And now he says that he has to go to Jerusalem, he has to suffer, he has to die, and that he will rose again. How do you understand that in the natural? How does it make sense? But we know, and I'll probably share a little bit more on that on Sunday, that we have an abundance of eyewitnesses who can testify that Jesus did suffer, 
that he did go to Jerusalem, that he were crucified and that he died there, and everything that happened surrounding that, but that he's also the risen Lord. So Jesus prepared his disciples for what had to happen there. One of my, I always joke in a sense, my, my five, favorite 500 verses or portions of scripture that I also want to read to you from Matthew 28, it's from verse 1 to 10, um, also a bit of a summary or a confirmation about the what was actually happening. So I'm first speaking about the what, and I'll speak just now about the why. So when we break up in little small groups and we use communion a little bit later on, we need to remember, we need to speak to each other and we need to pray together and we need to speak about the why and the what of the Lord's Supper because it goes back to the establishment of or the inauguration of the new covenant, but also it speaks about the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Matthew chapter 28 verse 1 to 10. Now after the Sabbath... Toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other, um, other Mary went to see the tomb. And, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And appearance, his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the gods trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. If we ask the what happened, here the angel confirms it. Jesus who was crucified. It's not just imagination. It's not just something that, that's a novel or something like that, fiction. Here the angel, together with testimonies or eyewitnesses, as we will see, it says here, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. And then Scripture says, He is not here, for He is risen, as He said. Come and see the place where we lay. And this is such a, a special place. Just think about this moment where this has happened. And it's, it's, for me, it's just beautiful. For you, I know that you seek this Jesus that has crucified. We're speaking about the what happened. Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus. And then in verse 6 it says, He is not here, for He is risen. That's the what. That's the what that we can talk about. That's the what that we can remember. That he, his body was broken, that he died on that cross, and that he rose again. It continues, and it says, Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to the Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they have departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And there you see already the preaching of this message of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in verse 9, And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. It's not something that happens any day. It's by God the Father's design. It was something that Jesus prophesied. It was something that was prophesied over his life, that he needed to go to Jerusalem, that he needed to suffer, that he needed to die, and that he needed to be resurrected. And here we see these two uh, portions of Scripture. There's, of course, many more. As I said, we can go and read all the Gospels, the specific account of, of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But church, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of our faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of our faith. No resurrection means a dead Jesus. No resurrection means empty promises. No resurrection means there's no power in the gospel. There's no hope. And the list can go on and on and it continues. But because... As was prophesied, because Jesus rose again and that the grave is empty, there's something specific and special that we can remember. 
as Paul wrote, and Jesus said, as we take, we use the bread and the wine, there's something, there's a lot of things that we can remember. And this is the what in terms of as we remember what Jesus did, that he died on the cross and that he rose again. So when we look on this special morning and we think uh, or we remember, we also need to answer the question about the why. Now the what, I just um, read to you two scriptures as a reference, there's many more, but the why, why did Jesus die on the cross? And I think that's a message where I can maybe keep you busy for an hour or two or a day or two because it's no small thing. It's probably the most significant thing that happened in all of history. The fact that Jesus died and that he rose again. That's the what. But the question about the why, you know, the long weekend or the public holiday that we have today isn't just because we've got a nice government and nothing against the government. It's just we've got a public holiday. But for us as, as God's people, as the church, there's a reason why we gather this morning. You are not here to hear a new message. We are here to remember what already happened. There's a what to what happened, but there's also a why. Now, I guess it will be a little bit unfair if I ask you this morning, and hopefully you've not been looking on your phones because I've posted something there on the announcements group, how many reasons, nah, if we talk about the why Jesus died, how many reasons would you be able off by heart to think about about why Jesus died. That'll one for everybody. One for everybody. Well, that's an excellent answer. I didn't have it like that, but <laughs> I mean to that one for everybody. That's awesome. I would quote Carol Cook beneath that one. Thank you, Daryl. But church, if there were one reason, if there were one reason why Jesus died on the cross, one reason would be enough. Because God Almighty doesn't just do things. God does things by design because He is God. He is our creator of the heavens and the, uh, the earth and us and everything around us. There's not only one reason. I, I, I'm tempted. Anyone else? How many reasons can you think of? Two, three, four? If we read the Gospels and the Epistles, how many reasons do you, would you say? Maybe 10, 20 reasons? Hands, please. Anyone? Church is allowed. It's not prohibited. We can be interactive. In my preparation for today, over the past two weeks, I came across, um, and I always refer to Daryl because we speak to him, John Piper wrote a book, 50 Reasons Why Jesus Came to Die. And when I, I came across it, as I was just preparing and reading and studying, I really want to recommend that book, 50 Reasons. It's for free. You can download it on a PDF from Design and God, their website. And I was actually astonished in a sense because I never thought about it that there might be at least 50 reasons. Usually when I think of the cross, I think of paying the price, atonement and sin and so forth. But there's a scripture that he uses in every chapter, 50 reasons to die. Now, I'll put it on the screen just now, and I've posted on our show for um, announcements group, so it will be hopefully on, if you're on the announcements group, it will be on your phone. But if we talk, we've just spoken a little bit about what Jesus did, lots of scripture references. But I can give you this morning 50 scripture references in terms of the why Jesus came to die. And church, I want to read it to you this morning, all 50 of them. And I want to encourage you that over this weekend, maybe if you want to download the book, as I said, it's, it's on a PDF, it's for free. But as we remember this morning, as we look back about what happened and why it happened, there's an abundance of reasons why we can be thankful this morning, why we can celebrate this morning, why we can worship this morning. And as I read from 1 Corinthians, when we use the Lord's Supper, there's 50 reasons. I know it's very small and, and I know you will probably not be able to see it, but I want to read it to you. So you can just listen or you can follow on your phone. 
Now, the exercise isn't just to, to um, uh, rumble off over the 50 reasons. This is part of our faith. This is part of the gospel. This is part of the good news. So I actually want to read every one of these reasons, and you will be able to find it in God's word. 50 reasons why Jesus came to die. To absorb the wrath of God. To please His heavenly Father. To learn obedience and be perfected. To achieve His own resurrection, resurrection from the dead. To show the, the wealth of God's love and grace for sinners. To show His own love for us. To cancel the legal demands of the law against us. To become a ransom for many. For the forgiveness of our sins. To provide the basis for our justification. To complete the obedience that becomes our righteousness. To take away our condemnation. To abolish circumcision and all rituals as the basis for salvation. To bring us to faith and keep us faithful. To make us holy, blameless and perfect. Number 16. To give us a clear conscience. To obtain for us all things that are good for us. To heal us, number 18, to heal us from moral and physical sickness. To give eternal life to all who believe in Him. To deliver us from the present evil age. To, to reconcile us to God. To bring us to God so that we might belong to Him. To give us confident access to the holiest place. Number 25, it's only halfway, but you will find a scripture or a text reference for each of these references or reasons. To become for us the place where we meet God. To bring the Old Testament priesthood to an end and become the eternal high priest. To become a, a sympathetic and helpful priest. To free us from the futility of our ancestry. To free us from the slavery of sin, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, so that we would die to, to the law and to bear fruit to God, to enable us to live for Christ and not ourselves, to make His cross the ground of all our boasting, to enable us to live by faith in Him, to give marriage as its deepest meaning, to create a people passionate for good works. To call us to follow his example of lowliness and costly love. To create a band of crucified followers. To free us from the bondage to the fear of death. Number 40. So that we would, so that we would be with him immediately after death. To secure our resurrection from the dead. To disarm the rulers and authorities. To unleash the power of God in the gospel. To destroy the hostility between races. To ransom people from every tribe and language and people and nation. To gather all his sheep from around the world. To rescue us from final judgment. To gain his joy and ours so that he would be crowned with glory and honor, to show, that, um, to show that the worst evil is meant by God for good. Fifty reasons why Jesus came to die. So I spoke this morning about the what Jesus did. He died on the cross and he rose again. And I want to encourage you to go and, if you want to, you can um, page through this book and maybe read through all the scriptures or the text references. I believe that they are sound. Jesus didn't this, this, there's a big, massive why Jesus did what he did. Now, I want us to read 1 Corinthians 
over again. And when Paul says that Jesus said that we must remember Christ, we remember Christ about the what he did and the why he did it. It wasn't just something he did in vain. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26 again. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, so Jesus said, this is my body which is for you. Shafa Christian Church, Wakubmund, it's for us and for any other believer. This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in, the, and in the same way also he took the cup of the supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We need to remember Christ for what he did. For often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. And it's something that we need to proclaim. But we can also proclaim, as we see in, in, in Matthew 28, that Jesus also rose. So it ends, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So church, it's something that we need to continue to do. We need to continue to remember and we need to continue um, uh, and we need to continue to proclaim the Lord's death. 1 Corinthians, a few chapters later, says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 says, And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. Praise the Lord that that is not the case. That we can rejoice this morning. That we can be thankful this morning. That we can talk this morning as we remember Jesus Christ. And we can remember and we can talk to one another about what he did. And we can also speak in an extended way about why he did it. And I believe this morning a book like John Piper's 50 Reasons That Jesus Came to Die, it helps us. It helps us to speak to friends or family or each other about what happened and specifically about the why it happened. So this morning as we're starting to end off, I want to ask the worship team, Clarence and the guys to come forward. And a very important part of what we are going to do this morning is when we turn to one another and when we talk, when we remember as we use the Lord's Supper, as we use communion together this morning, that we take some time, I want us at least to take about 10 to 15 minutes, and I want us to, to turn in little groups to each other. And if, you've, if it's on the, it will probably be a bit small on the screen, but if there's someone in each group that's on our WhatsApp group, um, our announcements group, I've posted there, that we briefly speak to each other about some of those reasons, maybe they're certain that really stand out for you, I mean, the what we know relatively well, the crucifixion and the resurrection, but the why is something that we can reflect on, that we can be thankful for, that we can share, that we can remember as we use the Lord's Supper all together um, this morning. And I want you to remember. Let's use this time so uh, the, the, Lord, uh, the, the communion or the elements are on the tables. I want to encourage you, maybe if you don't mind, to, to go and take it and then to break up into little groups. Let's turn to each other. Let's give thanks. Let's celebrate. Let's talk to each other about the what and the why. And let's obey Scripture in this sense, as Paul writes and Jesus says, let's remember about wh what Jesus did and specifically about the why. So for the rest of the morning, uh, or not the rest of the morning, maybe for the next 10 to 15 minutes, or you're welcome to stay uh, uh, longer, let's then break up into groups and let's, uh, let's remember, let's pray together as we use the Lord's Supper about why Jesus did what he did. Amen.